Hello, we'll be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The psalm for today will be Psalm 119 section sin and shin so this is psalm 119 verses 161 to 168 and this is not sin as in you are sinning but sin as in the letter in the hebrew alphabet which is the same as the letter shin but just a difference in the placement of a dot so psalm 119 beginning at verse 161 Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word, like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your just and righteous decrees. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Text for meditation is Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. So this is the ninth commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And with the explanation in the small catechism, which, will, which you can find at the top of page 322 if you're using your hymnal, so you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way that only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. So for, for the ninth and 10th commandment, since they're both dealing with coveting, usually, well, uh, when you're taking a course either confirmation or maybe adult catechesis or even just a Bible study, usually these are paired together, the ninth and the 10th. But for the purposes here, uh, I think I can actually break them apart now and, and deal with them individually because I have enough time. So what does it mean to covet? Well, coveting basically is and something inward that you're thinking, I want this thing, and then trying to acquire it in a way that is not correct. So this is something that does not belong to you, something that you should not have because it is properly belonging to another, but you're trying to get for yourself. Now, as I was talking about the structure of the Ten Commandments throughout the devotion series here, uh, 9 and 10, Commandments 9 and 10 correspond with the third commandment, loosely, where the third commandment is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Well, essentially, keeping the Sabbath day holy is, well, taking time to meditate on God's word, reflect on what he has given to us on this day of rest, and also to uh, uh, give back to God what is properly due to him, so namely prayers and worship. So in coveting, uh, forbidding to covet, it's talking about reflecting on what is proper to your neighbors. So not taking that, but intentionally making sure that 
you leave this proper to them, rather than taking something that properly belongs. So for coveting, uh, there's a couple different proof texts that we have, and I'll touch, I'll touch upon the story of Naboth's vineyard for nine, um, but before we even get to that point, well, why is it talking about... Wait, did I say... <laughs> I'm pretty sure I made a mistake a while back, and I read verse 16 when I'm talking about the ninth commandment. Okay, shall not covet your neighbor's house. So what does this actually mean? Um, why is it different from your neighbor's wife, man, servant, maid, servant, and ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor? So why is it separated having the house here rather than in everything else? So why is the house elevated even above a wife? Why is the house elevated above other people like your maid servants and man servants? Why is it elevated above anything else? Well, the household that we're talking about at this point in time in history is more than just a building. It's also more than just, properly speaking, a slab of land that you paid money for your government to use. So when we're talking about houses today, usually you think, well, I have this plot of land, I made this structure on it, and that's where I live. And yes, that is definitely a house and how we conceive of it. But the term, historically, is far broader in meaning. So when the, the Lord is talking to, say, the ancient patriarchs who were nomads, who did not have a physical structure, which they really, they really used as a house, uh, God would usually talk about the household. So not just a physical building, but the actual household itself. And when we're talking about, like, actually fellowship or a building or a structure to, to have fellowship in, that would be called a tent, because usually that would be what you would have. You would have a tent. So the difference would be, well, uh, the difference between house, as is meant here, and how we are understanding it is, a house is properly uh, that which, all, all your property, that which you have, and uh, versus just a simple building. So, connecting this with a household in a very broader sense, um, this would mean that those who are within the household who would be carrying on your legacy, namely your sons, also your daughters, uh, even, even your servants to a certain extent, uh, these would be proper to your house. So when you're trying to take somebody's household and violating the Ninth Commandment, and also if you're making a positive action, this would be violating the Seventh Commandment, not stealing. Uh, by doing this, you are now taking away not just a, a physical structure or a physical thing, but you're trying to take away a legacy. So the household of Abraham went forth, begot Isaac, and Isaac was now heir to all the promises of Abraham. So if you destroyed Abraham's house, you would destroy Isaac. You wouldn't destroy a physical structure, you would destroy the one who carries on all property. And we find this throughout the Old Testament that the heir of the family is incredibly important because this is what gives your life meaning. So you're, you're working, building, uh, doing all sorts of stuff in your life so that your legacy can be continued in your children. So having an heir is incredibly important. Not as much as it is today, though. Today we don't typically think about things like uh, heirs, but we do typically think about things like legacies. What, when we die, what do we leave behind? And that seems to be more the... Uh, secular take of the world, which, since they think that when you're dead, you're done, and this is, I guess, more of an agnostic or atheist uh, secularism, when you're dead, you're done, well, what do you have to leave behind? What, what benefit have you left? Well, only the things in this world. So they try to do that which is uh, good for them by making a huge legacy that their name may be remembered through what they have done in this lifetime. So. Looking back at the ancient period, what they're doing is they're trying to prepare everything in their household in order to bestow this on their children. So the heir is properly the one who's of the household, but also uh, the land itself. And I know I said before that it's not the property, not the structure, 
And truly, that's also not what it means here when I'm talking about land in terms of the household in ancient Israel. Because the land has a very different understanding in ancient Israel. Because when God brings the Israelites into the Holy Land, which he has yet to do, because this is still the middle of Exodus, God allots certain parts of the land to certain families. So when you die, you give this land to your heirs to inherit. So that land is now also your legacy, which is supposed to go on forever and ever and ever, according to the promises of God. Because the Lord has given you this land so that you may live in it forever, for all your generations. And you also see hints of this in the earlier commandments. So, for, ex for example, um, after the first commandment, when God and kind of gives a summary conclusion of what all these commandments are supposed to be, uh, he's leased with a comment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God is making sure that your legacy continues for thousands of generations, or the, the thing that this is figured for is forever. So forever, uh, my love will be given to you and, and uh, your legacy will continue on forever. Uh, also in the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother so that, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. So you're honoring your father and mother so that you may keep the household, the, the, heir, the inheritance that was supposed to be with your family forever and ever. So if you lose any sort of land, then you are destitute from your inheritance. But because the land is so important, there are many, many property laws uh, in the Old Testament, and we'll break out quite a few of those in Leviticus. But the idea is that even if you sell your land and it's no longer yours uh, to work anyways, it's no longer yours to work. It is still your land. Nobody can ever actually steal the land away from you. It's always your land. But you can sell it for certain portions of time, and at the end of 50 years, it returns back to your family. So you can sell it for a time, but the land is always owned by you and will be redeemed by you. And it will re be redeemed either at the end of the 50 years or if uh, a member of your household purchases it so that you can have it uh, back uh, to work. But the land always remains with you. It never leaves you. It stays there forever. And even in a lot of the prophecies where God is saying, you know, I will deliver you, I will, will save you, He's always kind of pointing forward to, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel now, where you will live forever and ever. So life everlasting is actually on that land God has promised to his people. Now, we know this is a little bit more figurative in the sense that God is giving the land of Israel, that is the promised land to all people everywhere. So if you're thinking about purely physical dimensions, Will everybody who has been saved in the church actually fit in the land of Israel? Well, probably not. But God is establishing the new heavens and the new earth. That is a land where we will have a real physical place forever and ever. And this will be our possession and inheritance. So when you're coveting, when you're coveting against your neighbor's house, it is, well, not just a physical structure, not just a strip of land, but it is that which is supposed to be due to you and your family forever and ever as an everlasting legacy that cannot be taken away from you ever. Um, of course, if we're actually following the Ten Commandments and keeping a close eye to them, there's also well, the implied caveat that, well, if you dishonor your father and your mother, you will not live long in the land and you will be taken out of the land also uh, even before the showing love to a thousand generations, there's the uh, there's a curse that you can punish the children of the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. So removing your family from the inheritance. So you will so you personally will not have an inheritance forever and ever, and this will affect not only you but your children, as your children need to actually be back in the covenant with God, and when they are faithful, they will continue on forever and ever to a thousand generations, although you will not. So the idea is that you should stay within this covenant forever, this covenant at Sinai forever, 
And if you leave it, then you are now destitute of your inheritance. So if you're trying to steal somebody else's inheritance, well, you're kind of violating one of the greatest things that God has ever given you, namely an everlasting promise. So that's why commandment number nine is such a big deal. Usually we don't think of it as a big deal, but it is. So, all that explanation. Well, we can look to the story of Naboth's vineyard. So this is during the time of King Ahab in Israel. And he's not hunting a white whale, no. He's just a very evil king, and he's doing very, very evil things. One of the evil things that he did was marry outside of the chosen people of Israel, and while that, well, it doesn't sound like an evil thing to do, he marries somebody who keeps trying to make him worship false gods, which is something God has forbidden people to do in Deuteronomy. But Ahab disregards the law of the Lord and goes out and does this anyways. So Ahab is living a rather sinful life, and there's always kind of a push and pull. Uh, he was the king at the time of Elijah, so Elijah, when he was facing persecution, it was at the hands of King Ahab or his wife Jezebel. And it's always a struggle between uh, forgiveness and, and sin with Ahab. So, uh, the story of Naboth's vineyard takes place in 1 Kings chapter 21, where, very, very brief summary, Naboth, he has this nice piece of land where he's growing vines, so he's uh, producing grapes, wine. And Ahab, well, he goes up to him and he says, let me have your, your vineyard to use for my vegetable garden since it is close to my palace. And in exchange, I'll give you a better vineyard or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. So, Ahab, mm, sort of, sort of doing the right thing in that he's trying to exchange something for it. So it's not against the law of the Lord to actually purchase land. In fact, this is one of the main ways that a family can get out of a tight situation is that they can actually be paid for use of their land. So the entire land system in Israel was set up so that people can endure. Um, so you can actually be paid for this land. But you should probably only be paying for land that is within the tribe, your proper tribe. So Ahab may not actually be doing this in the best way possible because he's kind of overstepping his bounds, saying, I will pay you for this particular land when you're not in trouble. But Naboth, as the head of his household, could have actually sold his land. And if he did consent to selling his land, then uh, he could, then Ahab would have it and there would be uh, no hard feelings, I guess. But Nahab replied, uh, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Nahab, Nahab, sorry, Naboth, Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Naboth is kind of hint, seeing the hint underneath all of this that Ahab does not simply want to have the land for whatever period in 50 years that we can get it for, because uh, the 50-year period is set, so you can actually sell the land 10 years away from that or the entire 50 years away from that. And then it would have to be restored back to the family at the end of that 50 years. So that, that's what's called a jubilee year. Uh, Naboth, kind of understanding the hint, is seeing that, okay, well, this king wants to take what is properly my inheritance for himself. And he's never going to return this to my family. So this would be similar to saying... Um, kind of nowadays, when you're trying to steal somebody's family, that you're trying to get them over to your side and steal your neighbor's wife, children, so now they're his family rather than your family. That would, that would be horrible. That would be taking away everything that belongs to him. So he would have no inheritance, no way to live anymore, and he would just be somewhat destitute. So... <clears throat> Ahab, uh, well, he threw a big fit about this. He went back to his palace, and uh, he's just kind of whining that he could not illegally acquire this, this plot of land. Now, his wife Jezebel overhears this, and he explains what happens, and then she kind of says, uh, you're kind of being a ninny about this, but I will try and get it for you. So what she does is, at a feast, 
Uh, she gets Naboth to attend, also a few revelers. Uh, she gets a whole bunch of people in attendance so that at this feast, Naboth can be falsely accused. So Naboth comes to this feast, has a couple of people at the side of him, they're enjoying it, and then these guys get up and all of a sudden say, oh, you blasphemed against the law of the Lord. And they, they say that he has broken the laws of Israel, and then Naboth goes off and is executed immediately, basically without trial, which not only is bearing false witness, but also uh, using the Lord's name in vain, because they're saying he's committing blasphemy when he is not. And there's also a um, misuse of government power, because Jezebel the queen knows this is wrong, but she's still executing him anyways. It's also not proper process. Um, and then just because they kill a fellow, it is absolutely a violation of the fifth commandment, so you shall not murder. So we see in here uh, the violation of not just one, but uh, let's see, first commandment, definitely. Second commandment, definitely. Third commandment, well, it's not on the Sabbath, so maybe not. Uh, fourth commandment, yes, because they're abusing government power. Fifth commandment, yes, they murdered him. Sixth commandment, no, they, they're not committing any sexual immorality. Seventh commandment, yes, they're stealing the, the vineyard away from Naboth. Eighth commandment, yes, definitely bearing false testimony. So, this is usually what happens when you violate something regarding coveting, either the ninth commandment or the tenth commandment. So, when you violate a commandment, it's usually a whole bunch of other commandments that you violate as well. Violating the ninth commandment in this particular scenario, uh, basically it involved the violation of seven other commandments. Sorry, six other commandments. But Ahab does not care. He just goes out and pays the money for the field so that the family, because they have lost Naboth, the head of the household, that the family can continue without the head of the household. So he, so he buys money, he buys the field for money, and uh, now tries to take it for himself and will eternally keep it. So this is why in the explanation to the Ninth Commandment, there's also uh, the caveat, so you're not to scheme to get your neighbor's inheritance or house, or get it in a way that only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. Because when you're coveting, who can really see that but you? When you're coveting, it is all in your head. You're trying to acquire something that does not belong to you, and you can, as as the explanation says, you can steam, scheme to get it. But, uh, yeah, people don't necessarily know that you're violating the commandment. Uh, only God who looks upon the heart knows this. So people will only start realizing this once you start uh, breaking the other commandments, uh, the, the other six, as I was talking with the story of Naboth. So, just, just so we know that Ahab doesn't get away with this, what ends up happening is that the Lord condemns him to death and that, that uh, dogs will eat him if he, if he keeps, if he doesn't repent. So Ahab, after he hears these words, he actually uh, repents of his actions. He calls the prophet Elijah to him, re uh, confesses his sins to the prophet Elijah so that Elijah can pronounce a, a, an absolution of sins over him. So this delays Ahab's death for a number of years, but if you want the rest of the story, you have to read 1 Kings chapter 22. But in this story, we also have a very good message for us because, well, we, we're practically the only ones who would actually realize that we're breaking the fifth commandment. Ahab, he got away with it. Nobody thought that he was violating sin at this time, uh, violating commandments at this time and committing sin. But he definitely did. God, who looks upon the heart, he knows exactly what we're doing and exactly what we're coveting. So even though other people might, might not be able to accuse us of violating the Ninth and Tenth Commandments, uh, God can still condemn us. But it is not as though we are wholly outside of God's forgiveness when we do this. God can still send people into our lives, like uh, God sent Elijah to the to Ahab 
to con for us to confess to, and confessing our sins to this person is representative of God. God hears our confession and forgives our sins, and the person who is he, God has put in front of us, they can, uh, as representative of the Lord, forgive them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is also what a pastor is for. So if you are violating commandments, and nobody knows that you're doing this, you might be able to get away with it in this world, but you still fall under God's condemnation. But God offers you uh, the gift of confession and absolution so that you may confess your sins, do what is right, do not scheme to get your neighbor's property, but only help them to preserve it, and receive forgiveness. So, as uh, it says in the explanation here, so we're supposed to help and be of service to our neighbors in keeping their inheritance. And this can be difficult for us, especially when we're in the world where it's uh, well easier to take than receive sometimes. So when we're looking at, say, um, inheritance sales, or no, not, not, not inheritance sales, estate sales, there we go where somebody has to give away all, everything that they've accumulated in life, well, it's best to make sure that if they're selling this property, to do what is right and pay fair prices for them, not trying to take advantage of their, their misfortune or, or, or uh, whatever is going on in their lives, but ensure that they still have what is good and proper to them. Um, so don't take what doesn't belong to you, and if these people have, are forced into selling these things, don't, don't uh, uh, take them for less than is good and proper for this person to have. So, the ninth commandment, like all of the commandments, is a prohibition against doing harm against your neighbor. It, in this way, it is uh, doing harm against them by your thoughts rather than outward deeds. Uh, the thoughts can become outward deeds, as... Ahab's thoughts became outward deeds, uh, the organization, the banquet, and the committing of many other sins. But they are properly in him. So, the ninth commandment actually allows us to introspect, realize that we are sinning and that we need help. As Paul is talking about his struggle in Romans chapter 7, he's saying, I did not know what coveting was until the law told me not to covet. Then sin, taking an opportunity within me, it now made me covet. So Paul is saying, well, I didn't want to do this before, but because I'm sinful, I now have an inclination to try and covet. I try to take what is properly my neighbor's. So even though Paul is not going out and stealing his neighbor's stuff, he's still battling the inward thoughts that he has. But Paul also contrasts this with the law of cross, Christ in the mind. That is, that God has placed within us a new heart, a new spirit, so that we may live according to his will. So when we know that we are confronted by our sin and that we're tempted to do these things, God has still given us his word and promises in the person of Jesus Christ, conveyed to us by the Holy Spirit who is dwelling within us, that we may realize these things as sin, repent of our actions, and do what is right. So it is not as though God abandons us in any of this, but he's constantly urging us to come back to him, to confess our sins, uh, even the ones that people don't see, so that he may forgive us and bring us into all righteousness. Amen. Uh, we continue on page 296 with the Curie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the world. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, Heavenly Father, 
There are some sins that are evident to the entire world and some that are known only to you. We ask, O Lord, that uh, you confront us with your law, that we may know that what is sin and what is right. And we thank you, O Lord, for sending to us your Holy Spirit, that uh, we may be compelled to confess our sins unto you and receive forgiveness in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, O Lord, for giving us forgiveness for all that we have done wrong, so that we may be found blameless on the day of judgment. Thank you, O Lord, for everything that you do for us, through your law and your gospel. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, at this hour you hunt upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms to embrace the world in your death. Grant that all people of the earth may look to you and see their salvation. For your mercy's sake we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.